So another angle, another way of explaining it uh, and showing it here is uh, the to show the the traffic as it passes through. So we're starting off with the uh, original call. Alice is calling Bob here. It goes in through carrier alpha. And then alpha knows that Alice is allowed to use that telephone number, A. And so it adds the passport to that. It goes through the network. And then ultimately it goes all the way through until it gets to the receiving carrier beta who verifies that the certificate, the passport was actually valid in that case. Uh, the identity header, which is the SIP header I'll show you, has to be carried all the way through uh, the network as, uh, as the call uh, passes. Here's an example of a SIP message um, with the identity header in it. And so here we've got a call, just a regular invite uh, to a telephone number. We've got a, uh, the from here says it's coming from Alice, uh, 1215-555-1212. We have an identity header here that is an encoded a digitally signed certificate that uh, has the information about the calling party, uh, the call led party, um, and the uh, some information about the identity of the carrier that put that stamp of approval on that caller ID in the first place. Um, we can, um, this is, as you can see, this is gonna make that, that sub message quite a bit bigger. There's gonna be a lot of cases in an informal study we did, we saw that there's a substantial number of cases where uh, the UDP messages are gonna grow beyond the boundary that can be handled unfragmented. And so one of the recommendations that comes out of this is you wanna prepare to handle larger SIP messages and the standard way of doing that is to switch to SIP over TCP or better yet, SIP over TLS so that you can um, send the, uh, SIP messages without UDP fragmentation. Fragmentation is a functional technology, but all of the standards recommend against depending on it because it has a, uh, a really um, a high delay and uh, there's a, it's a very inefficient technology for delivering uh, messages that need to be sliced into multiple packets. So you can see this makes the SIP message much bigger and has the information in here. Now let's look inside this identity header a little bit here. And we'll see, this is the identity header you saw before and I've split it up into three chunks. So we have the yellow chunk on top and then there's a period that separates it. And then there's a green chunk, a period, and then uh, a blue chunk. And then there's a semicolon and a, what appears to be a URL here. Um, so the, well, this, is, this is base64 encoded. So you, if you took my slide, the presentation that I emailed to you, you copied and pasted it into a base64 decoder, uh, either on your computer or just any website. It's, you can see it's not encrypted, it's simply encoded. So uh, this is like Pig Latin. It doesn't, uh, there's no uh, real encryption value for it. It's just a, a way of handling the encoding so that it can be delivered. Um, and uh, there, there is some, there is something unfortunate about the fact that we have uh, data inside of our SIP messages that have to be encoded in this particular way, but this is what the designers decided to do. So what this has is uh, the, the first part of this at the beginning has this ALG segment is a JSON uh, object. Um, it shows the algorithm, uh, the passport type, and it's got the, uh, ultimately this X5U shows the URL to the certificate used by the uh, service provider to sign the call. So you can see in this case, the URL is this, uh, this long URL. It's from clearip.com, which is uh, from the vendor TransNexus, one of the, uh, one of the leaders in the space actually, a uh, fairly small firm. And then they have a URL and that certificate is uh, used to uh, prove the identity of the service provider who signed the call. The green part, we have another JSON document which gives the attestation. So this is an A-level attestation. In the, sh in the TRACED Act, it actually refers in law to the highest level of trust available. And so effectively what they're saying, what the uh, legislators were saying there is they want uh, the calls to be signed with a high level of confidence and not there's these lower level of attestation that just mean things like, well, I don't know exactly whether they're allowed to use this phone number, but I know who I am. And so I can pass through the call without making any assertions about the legitimacy of the use of the telephone number. Well, the A-level attestation is an assertion that the signing service provider is confident that the sender of the call has the authority to place a call from that number. It doesn't mean that they can necessarily receive inbound calls to that number. It says that they can place outbound calls from that number. So let's say that they're a, a call center used by um, Health and Human Services and they're making outbound calls to remind folks to sign up for their healthcare plan. Well, if they have authority to do so, they're allowed to call from that number. 
they may not be allowed to call receive inbound calls to that number. Those calls may route somewhere else. So uh, this is an A-level attestation, and this refers to the highest level. There are these other levels uh, that you're probably not going to be very interesting in practice, but they're defined in the standard for these lower levels. And then, of course, we have the destination number, um, the telephone number, and we have the originating telephone number uh, here, destination or origination. And then we have this IAT, which is effectively a timestamp that says, says when this call was placed. And this is to say, this particular passport is valid, but it's only valid uh, for a call that was placed at this particular time. Uh, and then this orig ID is a uh, kind of call ID that can be put in there by originator, and it's not modified as the call goes through. So it's something that they cannot be modified as the as the call uh, travels through the network. It's just used for traceback purposes or other kind of troubleshooting. The pink part is the cryptographic signature, and uh, it is a signature over these previous uh, uh, previous parts, and this allows the verification step to confirm whether the uh, there's been any modification on the calling or call-in party number or the time of day or anything like that. So if you went in here and you modified, for example, the calling party number, then you, uh, generally speaking, would not be able to modify the cryptographic signature unless you had the private key that's based on uh, the computability and how much time people have. Uh, the type of algorithms uh, that are used to determine the strength of that cryptographic signature. But this is a this is considered mathematically and in the industry, this is considered a strong signature. This, uh, yes, you you cannot necessarily recover what data has been corrupted, but you can tell if the signature has been modified. And this is the essence of the secure part. It tells us that we know that we know that this particular passport was not modified uh, in transit through the network. Okay, so this is about as deep as we're going to go into the details of how Passport works. And this is about as complex as the technology uh, gets. Um, as a call flows through the network, uh, so you can imagine this is one of your um, telephones on your network. It's going to place a call. It goes into the SBC. And what I'm going to show you here is uh, one of the possible ways the Passport could be implemented. And it's going to go through... Um, through the network, it'll be, you'll have this question mark here refers to the SIP authentication process. So we check to be sure that this is a legitimate phone. So the normal SIP authentication that exists today, the call will flow through what's called your call control servers here. So that and eventually you make the decision to route the call off across the network to the destination provider. And uh, when you do that, uh, it's going to go out to another SBC. Uh, and that other SBC is going to be your path to some other provider here. And then one of the, uh, the standard frameworks folks are expecting to use is that that outbound SBC would do the work of adding the passport signature. So in this case, we see that SBC is configured to send the call to the STIAS, the authentication service. And then the call comes back with the, or a SIP response comes back with the passport on it. So that's the little gold seal there. So what this in practice means is that you could have an invite that goes to the STIAS and then you get a 302 header uh, response back. And that 302 modifies the headers and adds the identity headers. So as you see the call go through the network, it leaves your service provider network and it goes through the network with the gold seal on it. So that's the passport. It's going to flow through with the gold seal. Eventually it's going to reach the, the other side of the network. And uh, this is one way of doing it, not the only way, but you, one way of doing it is to have the call go in. And before we deliver it to the recipient SIP phone, we do an analysis and verify whether the passport was legitimate and then we, uh, we take that passport, once we check it, we put the green checkbox on it, and so maybe we modify the caller ID to say caller verified, or put out some other kind of indication, or maybe we put a special ringtone if the call is not verified. So you can make display uh, modifications like that. And ultimately, Bob receives the call with the green checkbox that says that this call has been, um, has been uh, verified in this case. <clears throat> 